Hello, everyone. Uh, we are here with a delay. Clara, thank you for uh, uh, for um, opening the meeting room. Uh, I want to apologize uh, to, to everyone on behalf uh, of uh, Steffi colleagues for the delay. Um, I want also to, to welcome you for our last uh, last uh, event of our uh, seminar series, and uh, uh, we have um, a, a big finale prepared uh, for you with um, three three great speakers whose work um, I have been admiring. I will uh, cut uh, the introduction short to. Uh, to reduce from uh, from the delay we have been experiencing. I hope there will not be any more technical uh, problems. Uh, I want to welcome Donna Riley from uh, Purdue, uh, John Mitchell from UCL, and Isabel Ryman from TU Eindhoven. Um, Donna, um, is it okay if uh, you start your presentation? Um, and in the meantime, please um, uh, stay in touch with us via chat and tell us where you are joining us from, especially this is uh, your first uh, event with us. All right, thank you very much. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen and it looks like that worked. Um, so so thank you all. Um, the, the topic that I chose for today is um, to talk about the possibilities of developing an aspirational good for engineering, which is something that um, other scholars have pointed out that engineering is missing. So I see engineering ethics as a way to uh, really create meaning um, for our profession and for our students as they are developing as future engineers. So um, Charles Harris, I think, was um, was kind of central in pointing out a few decades ago, or at least two decades ago, um, that there's a problem with our engineering ethics structure, that we really focus on a notion of public paramountcy, that engineers are to hold paramount the health, safety, and welfare of the public, um, and that in so doing, um, we, we really aren't setting forth an aspirational good, we're really just preventing harm. And public paramountcy has other problems that other folks have pointed out. For example, it really doesn't specify who is the public, whose health, safety, and welfare are we protecting, and most importantly, who decides. Um, there is a, um, a problem of a generic social value around engineering, where because we message that engineers uh, serve society and improve life for others, um, that Gary Downey has pointed out that that sort of um, implies that engineers sort of think by default what we're doing is virtuous and society must value the advancements in technology that we develop. Um, and in that, in doing so, there's kind of a drowning out of voices who might dissent from that and be trying to tell engineers that in fact, it's not working out uh, so great. Um, so, um, so those are some problems. It's also the case Aaron Sec has pointed out that there's a culture of disengagement in engineering education. That when we focus on on that technical work that we believe is advancing society, um, if we aren't really engaging others, um, then then we have this this idea that that doing so is somehow political um, or bad engineering, and and in fact the competencies required to do a proper protection of health, safety, and welfare of the public does require knowledges that depart from dominant engineering thought and practice. We might need to acknowledge our emotions. We might need to acknowledge a sense of the moral, um, some sort of normativity, and uh, the intellectual agencies of all persons, not just engineers in our ethics setup. So, um, so just an example of kind of how public paramountcy doesn't work in practice. Um, an example here from the US, um, it's actually an international example because the bridge goes to Canada. There's a bridge in Buffalo, New York um, that has been proposed to be broadened. Um, and the uh, diesel emissions from that bridge are a problem for, a, for the community alongside the bridge that tends to be predominantly African-American. And the public opposition to the bridge expansion resulted in engineers not responding to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, but in fact, trying to push approval through uh, without attracting the public's attention. And this happens in lots of different cases. Um, 
a case that has international implications um, that's very personal to me. I was the owner of a VW Golf diesel. Um, this is my car, Rudy, that I named after Rudolf Diesel. And uh, I had to sell my car back to Volkswagen because it was causing um, NOx emissions that worldwide it's estimated caused 10,000 excess deaths that shouldn't have happened had VW been honest about the situation. And at the time that this was a scandal here in the United States, our national public radio reporters asked the CEO of VW um, to be responsive to the fact that this is an ethical problem for Americans. And he, and he is an engineer, he's a computer engineer, Matthias Muller said, frankly spoken, it was a technical problem. We had targets for our engineers, they solved the problem. There were some software solutions that weren't compatible with American law. So here we are. And then he said, it was an ethical problem. I can't understand why you say that. And so there may have been some things lost in translation there, but I think that it really tells us that our engineers are really not getting it when it comes to the need for ethics. So we know that Volkswagen engineers did not hold paramount the health, safety, and welfare of the public. But more important, um, it's also the case that VW wasn't the only company that had problems here. Fiat Chrysler had problems here. BMW had problems here. Um, they were all circumventing the diesel laws for clean diesel. So um, there's a question here about what might go beyond individual decision makers or the actions of individual engineers and what might be structural about this problem. We see similar dynamics going on when we look at the 737 MAX or the case of Theranos, which was essentially a vaporware case where a Silicon Valley firm was trying to make a biotech innovation and it turned out there was no there there, um, but they rolled out a technology to pharmacies around the US where people got false data from various um, blood stick uh, finger testing for to diagnose various problems. Um, and so all of these um, innovations involve software in some way. They all claimed to benefit people or the environment. And they were all sort of um, really spurred on by problems around an unfettered market where the need to be competitive drove decisions against public and professional values. And the data systems provided a certain amount of cover for the ethical lapses. So what I'm saying here is that I think engineering ethics has to move beyond decision-making of the individual professional. And we need to be asking, what is engineering aspiring to? Because it really does look like we're aspiring to the next quarterly report for the shareholders rather than to some further benefit for society. So I think this is the unrealized potential of engineering ethics education to create a center that gives us a moral aspirational goal. Um, and so we can recenter public and professional values and reshape the role of our profession for current and future challenges. So if we start to look forward at what our future holds, um, we can look to, um, I think Stephanie Adams gave a great talk at um, ASEE in 2018, where she talked about our problems being um, something that, they, that Weber has called the social mess. So beyond complex problems or wicked problems, the social mess problems, which I note are socio-technical messes, not just, they're not just social in nature, right? So it's kind of a problem for engineers to call them social messes, but socio-technical messes. Um, and these are characterized by conflicting views of problem definitions and boundaries that the uncertainty is extreme in, in socio-technical messes. Values and principles are not um, things that people have consensus around. And in fact, people don't even agree on what the facts are. And so this is something we see with climate change, certainly in the US context, um, and also with things like AI and automation, where we're in a very fuzzy space, right? Just recently, uh, we have someone uh, believing that, in, that there's an autonomous agent that's sentient and other people are saying, no, we can't, nobody really knows what the situation is. So, um, so I guess the question is, how do we best prepare engineers to sustain core public and professional values in this, in this kind of space? Um, so, and then how do engineers and the public work together to create cultures of accountability and fidelity to those values. So my, my proposal is that we really need to um, get beyond the current pedagogies we use and beyond the content that we're currently teaching to really think beyond the individual professional. So 
beyond cases, we can use community-based learning to really ground ethics in action. We can employ critical pedagogies to help students see structures and systems. And we can use cont contemplative pedagogies and other means to really develop embodied aspects of ethics and affective aspects of ethics. Beyond the single course intervention, we really have to think beyond um, just having one course in ethics. We also need to think beyond the sort of micro modules where we're putting a little bit of ethics across the curriculum. Um, we need to do both of those things and more. So engineering ethics has to be taught over time to allow for, for reflection and growth. And we need both a modeling of caring about ethics. And I mean that in the deepest way that faculty need to care about ethics and show that in every course and engineering students have to see ethics taught by experts in philosophy to learn philosophers' ways of thinking and build intellectual power as part of a broad education for engineers. Then um, we need to go beyond simply teaching them critical thinking or perspective taking that we really need to instill creativity. They need to be able to develop ethics imaginaries to think about how ethics could be otherwise. And we need to foster system of systems thinking because of the complexity of the problems that engineers are going to be facing. We need to enable strategic understanding so that they can navigate the organizations that they're working in, in industry and in government. And we need to ask, what is the value out of engineers? Because if it is the case that AI is coming and AutoCAD is gonna become so automated that it doesn't need people so much anymore, what is the role of the engineer? And I would suggest that engineers can be ethical curators of socio-technical systems. So that means reframing engineering education. Um, so what has to change? We have to get away from the idea that disengagement is where, is where engineering gets its power. Um, engaged engineering is good engineering. And that means being engaged um, with various communities in the public and that is combining a technical and moral imperative. So we have to attend to how students prepare for action. They're not just thinking about ethics. They've got to do it. They need to develop empathy, listening, collaboration, power sharing. They need to be able to solicit all voices and challenge systems that don't afford deliberation. They need to, to uh, think about how they attend to different knowledges, values, and views in, in different groups. We have to develop cultural and epistemic humility in both technical and moral matters. And we need to make moral determinations from a position of that engagement and locally situated definitions of what public health, safety, and welfare might be. And our professional societies need to become much more active and engaged in critical self-reflection on stated and unstated political commitments. We have to take a stand and be engaged. So um, I spoke a little bit about how we really need engineering faculty to be modeling uh, a care for ethics. We need to model what an ethical engineer can be. And that means our classrooms have to become value centered. So learning and growth has to be the purpose, not credentialing and not grades, which seems to be more and more common these days. Reflection and mindfulness opportunities have to be present, even in the most technical of courses. Students have to be seen as moral agents, and we can draw on the work of Caroline Whitbeck some 20, 20 30 years ago, Miles Horton even longer ago, um, drew on the traditions of Danish folk schools and brought that back to uh, Appalachia <laughs> and taught Appalachian people that they can solve their own problems. Students need to be empowered in the same way. Um, we need to encourage critical thinking and reflective action, whether you want to think about that in a, a sort of King and Kitchener model of moral development that builds on, on sort of a moral psychology framework, or if you want to think more in the critical pedagogy framework, Apollo Freire and others, um, I think the result is the same. And we need to draw on experiential learning of folks like John Dewey, that students need to be dreaming, being, and doing all at once um, in their local contexts. So um, developing ethics imaginaries is something that I um, have been sort of playing with for a while. Yana Lambrinidou and I uh, wrote a paper where we just simply did the thought experiment of what if the principles from social work, which is a profession that centers an aspirational good, in their case, social justice, um, what if we took some of their principles and just plunked them into an engineering ethics um, canon, right? 
Um, so we added these, these uh, possible canons that you could add to an engineering ethics code where we position an engineer's primary goal as helping people in need or addressing social problems um, or challenging social injustice or practicing cultural and epistemic humility. And you can read the others. Um, and, and so we did the thought experiment of how, how would that change the profession? And I think you know the biggest lesson from the paramountcy clause is that it's not just changing the language in the canons, it's really thinking about what are the structural changes that you need to live that out? So where is the accountability for holding the health, safety, and welfare of the public um, paramount? Who, who holds us account to that? The public should, but we don't set up a structural system in which that's possible. So again, if we have this kind of language, well, who, who would hold the profession accountable to do those things? So I have an activity, but I think in the interest of time, I will just briefly say, if you have your own thoughts on ethics imaginaries, you have a chance to practice here. Um, what are some ideas you have of your um, kind of, what would you like to see as alternative ethics canons in your context? Um, so you can drop that in the chat if you have ideas of, of ways we might expand or change uh, engineering ethics content. Um, another thing I've been playing with lately is this, uh, I got asked to give a talk with the maintainers, if you know who those folks are. Uh, there's a group of people who have been thinking about how much we overfocus on innovation and we don't think enough about maintenance. Um, and these are people like Lee Van Sell and Andy Russell. And I got invited to give a talk uh, with a group called the Long Now Society Foundation. I forgot their name now, but there's some folks that focus on the idea of why aren't we thinking about things on very long time scales? whether that's 250 years or 10,000 years, you know, how do we really think about engineering for long-term solutions? And so in thinking about that, I was reminded of how ahistorical engineers tend to be. Uh, we don't think about things in, it, <laughs> in the past, and it causes us to ignore the antecedents of, of the engineering that we do. We think about the implications of our designs, but not why it is, what are the social, political, or economic contexts that gave rise to the work that we do today. And so we end up having all these unanticipated consequences that really we could anticipate if we studied history. Um, and Henry Petrosky has, has given a very concrete, literally concrete example of this in the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse, where he cites uh, English bridges that collapsed for very similar uh, reasons back in the 19th century, and that if American engineers had studied those cases, um, they they maybe wouldn't have designed the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in, in with the vulnerabilities to resonance that it had. Um, so, um, but I think more than that, we are missing critical understandings that can help us frame problems differently for the long term. So, as an example, we have uh, lead in water crises throughout American cities right now. Flint, Michigan, being the one that has perhaps gotten the most uh, press. And the thing about Flint, Michigan, is that its problems didn't originate with lead in water. They originated with, uh, with uh, governance crises where they uh, sort of were disenfranchised and uh, lacked autonomy as a city. They had racial injustice problems that, that predate by decades the lead in water crisis. They had economic injustice problems. And, and the fix is not simply replacing lead pipes. <laughs> that doesn't fix the rest of the situation that gave rise to that environmental justice crisis. And it will continue to have other kinds of environmental justice crises if these other root causes are not addressed. And so engineering solutions must have that holistic perspective. So that sort of brings me to Gary Downey's reminder from maybe 15 years ago that Problem definition is key, and we don't, engineers too often accept problems defined for us by others. And so we really need to think about the ethics of problem definition. Who gets to define engineering problems and who should define engineering problems? Right now, I see many futurists, uh, the Elon Musks of the world, um, who are focused narrowly on technological futures that project arrogance and privilege. We had last summer's um, privatization of space race was fascinating, <laughs> but really revealed um, kind of how certain folks are defining the future um, in a way that benefits very few um, at the expense of many. And we have shareholders who are defining priorities focused on next quarter. And we have, as a result, a collective reaction to disasters that we see as unforeseen or fast or sudden crises 
that Scott Knowles reminds us are actually slow disasters. These are things that are unfolding in real time that if we understood the long now, <laughs> we would see these as uh, predictable and, um, and, and happening over long periods of time. So how could this be otherwise? We need to uh, get a broader group of people in defining engineering problems and develop better engineering problems and to really think systemically about how can we develop a properly deliberative group of people to think about these things together. An example of this could be um, in uh, an example of problem definition is, is in Ruth Wilson Wilmore, Gilmore's book, Golden Gulag. So she writes about the prison industrial complex, um, which, uh, which is its own kind of thing where engineering tends to be hidden. And um, she, she writes in her book mostly you know, about how the prison system works in, in California. And she wrote about two engineering professors in the University of California system who were deeply involved in kind of legitimating the prison industrial system in conducting a capital cost reduction study. And what she points out is that uh, they did nothing to redefine the problem. So Ruth Wilson Gilmore would be uh, in, the, in the sort of category of an abolitionist where she is looking for alternatives to the prison industrial system uh, entirely, right? Um, and so she's pointing out that, that the central problem was crime. They continue to focus on imprisonment as a solution to crime. Um, and the solution ended up being more cost-effective prisons um, and a design bid build sequence in construction management engineering, right? Um, rather than reevaluating the system as a whole and to think about education and to think about what actually prevents recidivism and so on. And she points out that the unspoken power of the study lies in the way that the university legitimates the prison system and also re-legitimates itself as this perfectly efficient institution that the prison system ought to be emulating. Um, so there are also times when engineers just ought to say no. <laughs> and we see this with other professionals, right? Architects and pharmacists have backed out of participating in capital punishment. Um, they won't, architects will not design gas, gas chambers, or that is there are professional societies who say, we will not do this. Um, pharmacists also will not allow distribution of drugs um, used in capital punishment. And uh, that has caused disruption of actual carrying out of capital punishment here in the US. Um, psychologists and psychiatrists have declined to participate in prison torture. And I wonder, could our professional societies agree, for example, that water privatization is unjust? Or could we place bounds on development of artificial intelligence or automation or drug design and manufacturing? Uh, we don't discuss these very often. And it's often because I think we fear conflict, but then the default becomes anything goes. And I think that it's important to have these conversations because open dissent would be healthy and constructive. Even if you know it's a pipe dream to think that the American Society of Civil Engineers would actually take a position against water privatization and cause and say that water is a human right. <laughs> it would be interesting to have the conversation and to keep that consensus moving because that impermanent, the impermanent agreement itself uh, is is reflexivity, right? It causes us to reflect and think about who we are, of what we do, and to what ends. So finally, I'll just wrap up with one other set of ideas around feminist engineering ethics, which I also work in, and to just suggest that there are sort of three lenses we could use, one from feminist science and technology studies, which would ask, who's engineering? Which knowledges are we using? Which, what are we saying engineering is? And could we use feminist philosophy to really reconceive of this and acknowledge the current limitations in engineering knowledge and expand uh, the sort of epistemic landscape that we use to think about engineering? And could we reframe engineering problems in ways that make systemic inequity more visible and be conscious of that? Um, we can use the ethic of care, um, thinking about who is cared for, or cared about, or taken care of in engineering ethics. We can center that relationality um, which would then sort of get us out of the abstractions and reductionism that engineers really gravitate towards so easily and add more narrative and more context to our engineering ethics. Um, we can think about justice feminism and ask these core questions of who benefits and who bears the costs and who gets to decide about that, who is a moral agent, and how do we become accountable to others. And then applying all of these, we then 
can consider intersectional contexts, more transnational contexts, transnational feminist contexts, thinking about flows of labor across borders and so on, and rethink ethics around community-based engineering work and deal with the moral remainders. There are no perfect solutions to ethics problems and we will need to revisit the relationships and the, and the consequences of our decisions iteratively. So that's what I had in a, in a quick nutshell, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, for bringing uh, such rich perspectives uh, for discussion. And um, uh, for me, it was inspiration to see um, the, uh, the many different ways of broadening and thinking deeper about uh, engineering uh, ethics education, the philosophy of engineering ethics education. And uh, I see that we have a couple of comments um, on chat. I also want to open the floor for any uh, questions you might have. So please, um, uh, raise uh, raise uh, the virtual hand if you have any question and uh, in the meantime i could invite uh, liz chin um, to to share the comment uh, on chat with us uh hi yeah i'm um, a phd student at um the at dtu uh, technical university of denmark mm -hmm. um and one of the things we did as part of an ethics course was we did a values workshop with some of our um, global business engineering students. And before we got into the whole, um, yeah, the nitty gritty of ethics, um, we wanted to just do a couple of days of, uh, yeah, two sessions of values workshops. And the first thing we did was just basically get the students to assess what their personal values were and, were and how that would apply. And most of them hadn't even thought about it. They hadn't done any kind of introspection on how they go about living their life and how that can apply when they go into industry. And then we looked at applying that into um, a business context um, and looking at company values and all that kind of thing. But I was just thinking that in regard to what you were saying um, about, um, about ethics and having values, I think sometimes we need to start with ourselves um, and then that can apply into the business setting and use that as a framework because then when they are acting with their own values, it can be incorporated in having that meaning on what they want to do further and creating value beyond that at every step of the way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also talking very concretely about how to navigate conflicts when your personal yeah. values don't, don't align, yeah, right? Definitely. With employers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, Tony, uh, I also see a comment uh, from you via chat, if uh, you want to pick this up uh, for the plenary. Okay. One of the things that I've found with the research that I've been doing over the years um, is the use of fundamental human needs, uh, the Max Neef model, which is, which is embedded in values. And those values are, are, are deeply involved in how other people are affected by what we do and are very communitarian in how we go about things. Um, I first came across this uh, working in South Africa during the transition years. And uh, I found that it, it brought using those, those uh, nine uh, elements of it, I found it just very useful uh, in understanding community and linking in with community. Mm -hmm. So as a mindset, uh, the fundamental human needs of Max Neef are awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's a really interesting, interesting approach and to really think about well, how does that, you know, what would it mean for the profession to align behind that, right? Or um, also, I know there's a lot of talk about the sustainable development goals as a as a as an as an alignment uh, mechanism, right? And I think that's a I think that's an interesting place to start to at least start a conversation, right? About could we could we do that, and what what would that look like if we were to do that? It's a great thought experiment, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have uh, time for one or two more questions. So um, please uh, raise your hand uh, um, as I don't want to push uh, now 
my privilege. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, and uh, we'll keep them either for later or uh, dare to ask one now if uh, no one raises uh, their hand. So uh, for those uh, who would like to prepare a question, I will I will formulate uh, um, a question based on some challenge I um, I perceive. I feel that uh, it is quite difficult to get the buy-in of teaching staff, even when it comes, let's say, to micro ethical ways of teaching ethics. And you are talking about ethics of care. You are talking about feminist ethics. And I want to ask, uh, what is your experience and what are, are your strategies? for getting um, engineering staff uh, uh, interested and open to, to engage with these um, uh, theoretical understandings and human understandings of ethics. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the most important thing is to em empower them. Like the most, the most common thing I hear is I'm not qualified to, to teach this. I don't, you know, and, and they talk about the deficiencies in their own ethics education, right? So, <laughs> So that's and that's it, it really telling that this is persisting over time. I mean, I've been I've been around for a little while now, so I'm seeing this happen over <laughs> generations of people um, that that whatever it is that we've been doing, we think that we put ethics into the curriculum and yet we still have people saying uh, that they don't feel competent to teach ethics. And so the more workshops that we can do when we think about how far we've gotten with active learning, right, we've been able or problem based learning, right, we've been able to through a, a broad series of workshops and just continuing to to offer those opportunities, people have become more confident and tried stuff out and become their own experts. And so I really think we need to take that approach. And I think we haven't quite hit the same critical mass that we had with, um, you know, with active learning approaches, but I think that we can get there. And it's a matter of, of just continuing to, to build that and to offer more and more workshops there's always a need people go to those when they have them right so yes. so it's just a matter of let's let's try to get people more confident uh get people ready to do it, it it's difficult because they're also we're dealing with a uh curricular canon where there's this feeling of that you must cover certain certain topics and so how you know while i'm teaching thermodynamics how do i put you know ethics into it and so really helping people uh, marry those things and build it into the courses that they are teaching is is important, right? And so that's where those sort of very um, very small case studies and those kinds of things have proven convenient and practical. But I also think we can go deeper than that. Thank you. Thank you for your response. And I'm glad you mentioned the uh, active learning as uh, our first speaker, um, Isabel, will uh, talk about how she merges active learning, challenge-based learning with uh, ethics. And uh, our final comment, uh, Sally, uh, please um, have the floor. Hello, Daniel. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Good morning. Good evening. What is uh, <laughs> the time there? Uh, it's not too late. Too late there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm in Australia, for those who don't know. Um, I wondered if you would like to explain a little bit more about what you feel philosophers add for students that perhaps they wouldn't get from engineering academics. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's their ability to to kind of, it's almost a, it's so strange way, the way I describe it, this is me as an engineer speaking, right? But <laughs> I perceive it as a superpower because <laughs> because they sit above the epistemology, right? It's this kind of a of that they see the superstructure of our thought, right? So they're able to to help engineers see the sea that they swim in, right? So you don't because when you're sort of act you know active in in enacting say a positivist framework um, in your studies in science courses and engineering courses to have someone who can partner with you to help you see that that is what you are doing and that there are choices being made that you might not have been aware of. I, I think that's really a powerful experience. The, the kinds of questions philosophers ask are things that engineers don't often get the, the opportunity to think about. And so helping them, helping them to do that and to understand the different traditions. And, and also, I think that, you know, when I look at how our engineering ethics textbooks have been derived, they take the sort of maybe greatest hits of like, well, here's some, <laughs> here's some examples of big contrasts of ways to think about ethics, but it's not very complete and it's not very nuanced. 
Um, and I think that you really get you get more of that nuance and the and a sort of deeper understanding of how philosophy and ethics works. That said, philosophy has its own problems. <laughs> and when we talk about something like feminist ethics that I've just talked about, that's also on the margins in philosophy. And so it, dep it depends a little bit on who's teaching your philosophy class, <laughs> whether that ends up being uh, as broad as I've just described it, or if you're really going to get, um, you know, a slice that's that's uh, just a small piece of of what you could be learning. So I think it's always important to make that as visible as you can to students so that they can see uh, what's there and what's not there. Great, thank you. Very clear benefit with the limitations as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. And we would have Donna uh, for the last 15 minutes of the seminar together with the other two speakers for a final plenary discussion. And now I'm very happy to, to welcome John uh, Mitchell to describe uh, the work he has been doing at uh, UCL. Slides are good. There we go. I need to find find the mute button somewhere. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to this session. Um, my name is John Mitchell. I'm the co-director of the Centre for Engineering Education here at UCL. And I was thinking of taking a, a slightly different different tack. I think you've 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 heard most eloquently from Donna about both the need for uh, ethics education for our engineers and also a, a really innovative approach to engage um, students with ethics. So I'm perhaps not the best person to talk about the ethics specifically, but wanted to talk about how to find a way to embed it in the curriculum and to make two arguments about how we should approach the teaching of ethics more generally uh, across our engineering curriculum. So I'm, I'm not gonna talk particularly about the, the teaching of it per se, but would like just to, you know, give a, a shout out to colleagues, Raffaello Arconi, Sarah Hitt, and other colleagues who've put together this fabulous engineering ethics toolkit that's available from the Engineering Professors Council. There's plenty of, you know, lots of case studies on, on this site, but also many others. I know Sefi has done work in the past on this to really provide case studies for, for ethics and resources for people to use. Um, because I think, you know, we are understanding that ethics is something that is absolutely critical to our, our engineering graduates to understand. Um, in the UK, we've just updated the um, accreditation manual for what needs to be in our, in our courses. And one of the things that has, that has been highlighted perhaps more prominently than ever before is the need for uh, a, an element of ethics within, within our accreditation framework. Um, but I particularly wanted to pick up on the choice of language here that the uh, Engineering Council has decided to use over ethics, because it talks about making ethical choices. And I think that's very important and something that, 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 that Donna picked up on, on, on there about how we go about including ethics in our, our, in our curriculum and how we involve it uh, as part of the way that engineers see the world in which they, they operate. I think historically one of the issues we've had with teaching ethics is we've we've tended to view it as a bit of a black and white white subject. Um, although you know even uh, you know, the uh, the analysis of the Volkswagen scandal that we've we've heard already, you know some people still can't work out which side is black and which side is white. But the idea that we've you know you you don't use screws that are too short in aeroplane windows or you know some of the these really quite seemingly quite binary decisions that we we argue about, um, but actually where the interesting parts of the ethics is in this grey area, where these choices come about, where the personal values come about, and so. Now, certainly I've been interested in discussions with students about um, values. I, you know, I work in the in the communication space and I've always worked with defense contractors, but never knowingly worked on, on offensive weapons. Um, you know, I've worked on some some radar systems for surveillance and things like that. But I, I you know, I have a personal personal view on that. I have many colleagues who will work on weapon systems. I have many who won't work with defense contractors at all. And that's a personal choice that people are people are making as to where they they see their own personal values and i think what we need to talk with our students a lot more about 
is how these choices, these ethical quandaries that are more and more being presented within our, 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 our life as engineers, our designs as engineers, really play out and not presenting them as, as singular choices. But this does present anyone designing an engineering curriculum with, with something of a problem. We have a very full curriculum. It's absolutely jam-packed with all the, the good mathematics and science and all the things that we, uh, we know and love of our, our engineering curriculum. And over recent years, we've been pushed more and more to find room for more things within our curriculum. Um, improve our students' writing, uh, improve innovation, our, the creativity, um, systems thinking. And there's a whole range of things that we've been adding to our curriculum, including social responsibility, ethics, management, that are all very important. They're all clear uh, wins for employability, what um, industry is demanding of our students. But it does mean we have little space to put another element in um, and as some have, have often argued you know have, have often decided to do a an accreditation course a module on sustainability these sort of things that sit outside the curriculum and our curriculum is full to bursting particularly given the other drive we have of far more practical engineering uh, more make and build projects and this whole design thread that is now becoming something that is is central to our engineering process so with this in mind, what I want to argue for in this talk is that when we think about how we're going to teach ethics, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the, the method of doing so, but that in teaching ethics, we need to make sure that it's embedded within what I would describe as an integrated curriculum. And this is a, a shift that we've been, been working on at UCL, and I know many others are looking at, into how we can move away from a modular structure where things are put in, in boxes, often for very um, good benef uh, and beneficial administrative reasons, but that are making sure that our students see an integration between elements. And I also want to argue that ethics is not a, not a standalone subject. It's not something that we can, even if we could find the room to do, would want to do as, a, as an isolated uh, element within our curriculum. So, I'm just going to say a little bit for a moment about what it, what I see as an integrated curriculum, because we, we use the word actually to describe our entire curriculum at UCL, but also um, there are many things that can be integrated. And one of the, the useful things of the word is that it, it allows us to describe many things we've tried to do within our curriculum. So, and they're all actually, I, I think, fundamentally important to the way we can ensure that students engage with ethics and other topics beyond the technical that we want to embed within our curriculum. So there are a number of things that we can integrate. I think fundamentally one would be the disciplines. Um, certainly when, when I first started becoming involved in curriculum development at UCL, our disciplines were very siloed. They were separated. They didn't really collaborate with each other as part of the teaching. Um, and there weren't opportunities for students to work together on, on real problems that brought their expertise of their discipline. And so I think a fundamental feature of an integrated curriculum is our opportunities for, the, for disciplines to work together. Um, we still want our students to come out being electrical engineers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, whatever they may be but understanding how they bring their expertise to bear on real problems with other disciplines in tandem is critically important. We'd also want to integrate the theory and practice. Again, this is probably one of the most popular forms of integration of uh, moving away from a curriculum that's theory heavy at the beginning and the practice really only comes to bear later on. And so a lot of the project and problem-based learning approaches, we're seeing more and more of active learning approaches, really um, integrate the theory and practice from a very early stage within the curriculum to ensure that students are seeing those in tandem. The third element of integration is, is that of skills. Again, we've, we have in, in some quarters seen uh, curricular models where skills were taught some, somewhat separate to the theory and potentially to the practice. And bringing those together that students are developing their skills in context, 
integrating the theory with the, with the delivery in practice is vitally important. Something we've certainly done less of, but I know many are, are, are working on, and I think it, you know, it's a particularly interesting area, is bringing the, the workplace in and integrating it into delivering core elements of the curriculum. You know, we have a long history of students taking placements in industry, but somewhat separate to the engineering curriculum. It's a, it's a different step along the process. But we're seeing more through, certainly in the UK, things like degree apprenticeships, where when they work well, the skills picked up in the workplace are critically linked to the fundamental engineering curriculum and not a, a different experience that, that although complementary and augmenting what goes on in the curriculum is actually a central part of the curriculum. And finally, integrating assessment. And this really means, I think, looking at authentic assessment and, and assessment potentially at a programme level, where rather than, than evaluating learning outcomes singularly, we're looking at um, assessment that, that really measures a, a larger quantum of knowledge where students are integrating things from various parts of their course together, and we're assessing that integration at earlier stages. I think we could argue we're often doing that through capstone projects, perhaps, but actually opportunities for integrative assessment far earlier on within our curriculum. So I hope that says a little bit about what an integrated curriculum can be, but why, what are, our, what are I arguing that are the benefits? Well, I think one of the key benefits is it plays to the way that we're seeing our students increasingly wanting to design creative solutions to major global challenges. We are seeing far more social awareness from our students, albeit not always knowing exactly how to enact that social awareness, but we, I think we're seeing far more engagement with the, the critical questions and seeing engineering as a path uh, to play a part in solving them than, than perhaps certainly I think back to my generation there was something that we ever wanted to, to connect and our students are now less willing to accept our, our previous sort of arguments that you must do the theory and before you can do the practice um, and this is really playing both to, to their desires but also the way that, that employers want to want to see their employability skills of their graduates um, which follows on from looking for competencies that allow students to work in what are going what are already but going to be really complicated um, workplaces where you know we should be producing you know, graduates that are able to work in the the diverse and inclusive workplaces that you know we have to believe are going to be the workplaces of the future where our, our students are working uh, you know across different boundaries and, and working in very different areas all the way. So I'd like to put an integrated curriculum as, a, as a, a one model of, of how I think we should create our curriculum to give us opportunities to teach subjects such as ethics. But then follow that up by also arguing that I, I don't believe ethics is a, is a subject that does stand alone. Um, and I think, you know, I think Donna in the presentation touched on, on, on a lot of the, the issues that, that, that come to this in that, you know, historically, certainly in, in my discipline, ethics was something that was, was considered somewhat in, in the abstract compared to many of the other issues that uh, we, are, we are wanting to, our students to consider. And when we look at the list from the accrediting body that I put up at the beginning, we're seeing that there's a, a range of subjects beyond the technical that we want our students to understand. And so what I would like to argue is that, you know, when we look at ethics, actually what we are looking at is an intersection between many considerations, um, often best placed to be considered through a design lens and a, and, and a process of, de uh, of design and a process of problems and solution through design that encompasses a whole range of things that inter interconnect through equity, inclusivity, sustainability, and, and aspects such as risk. And that in moving away from a, a binary decision of doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing, when we start talking about making ethical choices, making ethical decisions where there is no singular right answer, we are making ethical decisions about what we mean by sustainability 
how we enact inclusivity, inclusive for who. These are ethical decisions that we will never be able to make 100% perfect, ideal, correct answers, but whether we're always balancing uh, different types of types of trade-offs. And so um, the work that colleagues at UCL, uh, Emmanuel Attili and others are, are, are leading on is how we draw these together under a, a frame that we're, we're talking about as social responsibility and using models such as responsible innovation to consider how we can uh, allow our students to explore the connections between these in everything that they do. So rather than just, um, you know, we, we do need to support our students in how they develop their thinking in these ideas, but more so we need to provide a range of opportunities for the students to put them in practice and to really acknowledge that at all points, when there is an engineering problem to be solved, a design to be attempted, these issues will be at play. Now, I think far too often we, we choose to ignore them. Um, you know, I think the, the, the Volkswagen quote is, is, is very illuminating that, uh, you know, even professional engineers have chosen to ignore some of the, the, these elements when, when, when making really quite, uh, quite major design decisions. But we need to embed within our students the idea that, you know, taking models such as IDEO of, of desirable, feasible and viable, desirable is critical. The decisions we make about whether something is, is desirable, and that could be desirable from environmental sustainability, from ethical, from inclusivity angles, are absolutely vital to good engineering design. Um, to, to quote a colleague of mine, one of his favourite uh, sayings was, we need to think of social responsibility within our curriculum as a stream, not just occasional puddles that our students can dance through or even, even less welcomely walk around when necessary. This it needs to be something that becomes absolutely embedded in their way of thinking and in their culture. And to do that, I think we need it to be applied and in context. Our students far too often will, will shy away from anything that they see that is not engineering. And I think, you know, if we present some of our ideas in this space in, in ways that don't connect it to what is authentic as, a, as an engineering problem to our students, you know, acknowledging what I said previously, that I think our students are far more connected to these ideas being something that is fundamental to engineering then you know, we risk them, them ignoring them and shying away from them. If we can actually embed them in, in, in real applied context of, of engineering problems, I think we stand a much better chance of enabling them to, to, to change the culture of our, of our student populace to, to have this in the forefront of their minds as they approach the engineering challenges. So I hope that gives you sort of an idea of some of the thinking that we've been we've been working on at UCL. Uh, my colleague Emmanuel Attili talked at some length about some of the ways we've embedded this in some of our projects in a in a previous CEFI meeting. Um, so you know if you want to find out more about how this plays out in some of our courses, I, I suggest I think she's about an hour into the uh, into this YouTube video if you want to uh, to check that out. Um, but I hope that gives you an idea and Thank you very much. Thank you also, John, for showcasing the work you have been uh, doing at UCL together with your colleagues, Emmanuel Attili, Kate Roach, who both uh, spoke um, about, um, um, about the integrated curriculum that you have uh, been implementing and that makes UCL one of the leaders uh, uh, in engineering education as a report um, by Ruth Graham also shows. And I'm now very glad to give the floor for comments uh, or questions. And uh, in the meantime, uh, while you are preparing your comments or questions, I could, uh, I, I also want to invite Sarah to describe uh, the work you have been referencing, John, the work with um, uh, the Engineering Professional Council <laughs> and the toolkit uh, developed. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Diana, and thanks, John, for letting everyone know about that. So we 
embarked on a, this is work supported by the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Engineering Professors Council to develop a toolkit specifically for educators to help overcome some of these challenges that both Donna and John have addressed in really making ethics um, integrated into the process of engineering all the way through, not as an added or extra or uh, sort of tangential topic. So uh, it's a growing resource. It's not a static resource. Um, we, we are hoping to include more and more um, components to this and to involve the community uh, in, in as many ways as we can. So um, Deanna, I'll, I'll be looking to you to help us um, advertise this to through this FE community. You'll be hearing more about that soon. Yes, uh, we will be glad to, to uh, help you develop uh, the work further. Um, any any comments, uh, Cynthia? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation, John. Um, I have a question regarding challenges to make the integration across the curriculum because faculty can control sometimes what they can teach in their classroom, but how do you put everybody on the same page? in your department to be able to make this a stream from the beginning to the end on, on the student experience. Any advice in there? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think you have to be pragmatic. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I'm probably giving away one of the trade secrets, but I, I've said it so often it can't be a trade secret anymore. We talk about the curriculum at UCL as if it was one large homogenous well designed and entirely sort of integrated thing it's not um there were there was an opportunity to change cer certain elements but i think we what what we have done is refocused it and so rather than it being really focused around sort of lumps of content in modules here and there we've tried to put a, a central thread that, that that is the sort of central focus of things and so actually you know, 80% of the curriculum is relatively unchanged as what it was before. There are still colleagues teaching their classes as they were, but they they are connected and we've had some negotiation with them where we 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 it fits to the cent the central, particularly the thread of projects and scenarios that runs the way through. So I think you know you 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 could try and do a full you know, top to bottom curriculum review that, as the English would say, is a very brave move. It, it requires a lot of effort and a lot of getting everyone on board. Um, but, you know, I, th I think, you know, you, you, you have to deal with what, what you can, what you can influence. But, you, you know, I think as a minimum, you need to create enough space to put this, this thread in the, 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 that, others, that others feed off. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that's effectively what, what we have done. And over time, it diffuses. For a long time, I didn't believe in a sort of diffusion model of change that others will follow. But I, I'm beginning to believe that if there's enough of a critical mass, over time, it does start to, for, for others to develop. So I think, you know, there are some institutions, I can see some represented here who have started with more blank sheets of paper, and then it's a slightly different, uh, different situation. But if you're moving from a a traditional curriculum, you know, I think lots of colleagues have found ways to find space within their curriculum to enable to do these sorts, sorts of things by removing duplication or, you know, um, often some of the, the exam periods, mid-sessional periods they can change, but, you know, building it up to, 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 to focus the, the, the mind on certain elements where you can. We, we have time for uh, two, two more questions or comments. I also want to take the opportunity to, to ask your opinion about the changes in the accreditation requirements that, that you mentioned earlier. And um, ethics was subject of such changes in 
uh, several countries, UK, Ireland, Donna, Donna, you were one of the voices that invited to um, do this process in a, a conscientious manner. Um, so I want to ask what, what is the role of um, an engineering education leader, uh, Dean, uh, the departmental head, in um, collaborating with uh, those uh, overseeing the development of accreditation requirements to, to give a, a better or more emphasis to, to ethics? That's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think certainly, you know, from a UK perspective, AHEP4 is a very good document. I think it has changed some of the emphasis and if nothing else, I think it has, um, you know, spurred a conversation about the, a direction of travel for engineering education that is very, very positive. Um, I'm less positive about the actually enacting of credit of accreditation and the accreditors you get and whether they understand good teaching of ethics if it dropped on their foot while they were looking around <laughs> the department. I that I'm much less. Um, I think uh, confident of, but I think you know certainly in the in the short term we, we you know people are taking notice of it and are and are looking at what what they should be doing uh, and, and so that that can only be a good start, but uh, it, it isn't a final solution. Thank you, thank you. And Donna, I saw you nodding, and uh, as I said, you have experience with uh, being involved in this process. I, I mean, I was just typing, it, it's uncanny how similar that experience is, that, that the evaluators in particular kind of come in with their norms and they either don't recognize ethics, as John said, or they or they just are reinforcing a, a low bar, a very low bar. And accreditation is always the floor. And it's important to keep that in mind that all you're doing is kind of raising that floor a little bit when you change the expectations um, and it and it's rare to find programs that are really inspired by something in it in your accreditation criteria. So I think it's it's just one tool and it's a subtle it's a subtle one because of that tendency to kind of set that norm in the in the visit. Sally, do you have experience um, uh, with um, this process in Australia? As I think um, the, Australia, um, the body, Engineers Australia, is also now quite uh, active in uh, bringing stakeholders in the formulation of um, accreditation requirements. Yes, this is true. Also, Engineering New Zealand, actually. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that people might like to have a look at Engineering New Zealand's website. They've tried to work with engineers to describe what ethics in practice actually means in very practical ways, um, which is another angle. I think we have a long way to go, and, but the, um, the changes to the International Engineering Alliance graduate attributes help us as well. And certainly the Engineers Australia, I think one of the benefits we have in Australia is that Engineers Australia and it is closely a lot, it works closely with the Australian Council of Engineering Deans and also, of course, the Australasian Association for Engineering Education, which is a technical society of Engineers Australia. And so it's it's there are mechanisms for us to be able to work together in adjusting the accreditation criteria and especially on deep questions such as this, which is nice. Um, thank you, uh, Tolfri, for sharing your experiences. And Emanuela, I would uh, suggest um, uh, keeping this question as a first question um, uh, for the plenary discussion after uh, Isabel's uh, presentation, so we can bring all, uh, all perspectives together. Uh, are there any uh, last uh, comments um, or questions for John? So if not, we have well, we will have fifteen uh, minutes uh, at the end um, of um, of uh, Isabel's presentation. And uh, now I am uh, very glad to introduce someone that I can also call a colleague, uh, Isabel Ryman from Innovation Space at TU Eindhoven, and uh, uh, her work on uh, challenge-based uh, learning and responsibility. Yes, thank you.
Um, is my screen okay? As a presenter's notes were visible, but now it's okay. Now it's okay. Yes. Okay. So yes, thank you. Um, thank you also for inviting me. I have not an ethics background, uh, but <laughs> I, I'll, uh, I would like to share what we do in Eindhoven, eh, where uh, Diana is also really working in the ethics area. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we develop further challenge-based learning at, um, at our university. And um, yeah, I really see this as developing also responsible engineers of the future. I would just take you in our journey or to show how we see this. And um, yeah, I, I like also to get more input on uh, how we can even strengthen this because I really learned already many things in the previous uh, presentations. Um, I think the starting point really what we have uh, in Eindhoven is we want to, as a university, uh, we want to collaborate to solving this uh, the big uh, problems in the world, the big challenges. And of course you need products, services, systems for that. And there also engineering plays a role. Um, but that's also the technical view. Uh, but the aim to develop these goals uh, and to um, solve uh, these big challenges is there. And of course, this cannot be done only uh, from the engineering and the technical perspective. We really need to collaborate with many different parties. This is uh, really what we believe. So not only academia, who plays a role there, but also the government, industry, and the citizens, so taking everyone into account. Um, and then um, taking these people into account means we really need to look at networks or ecosystems. I'm also a chair uh, design of innovation ecosystem. So sorry, that's my bias. <laughs> but I really believe that it's together with many different perspectives, many different people, we can um, uh, solve these challenges. And um, uh, universities where they also educate people uh, play a, a key role uh, in this. And uh, what you see is, and it was already mentioned by previous uh, speakers, that the students themselves, they really want to solve these uh, big challenges. They are really passionate. And it's, I think that the, the, the big driver for change comes from the students themselves, because they really say, I like to contribute there and have an impact and do something useful. And this means that also education needs to change. Just following, and I completely agree with what said before, eh? integrating theory and practice um, and let them work already on relevant things and, and do that in, yeah, in a completely different education environment. And in Eindhoven, we, uh, we tried out something. So it was already mentioned that Graham study engineering uh, a sector needs to change so work-based multidisciplinary we even say interdisciplinary programs and engineering design and self-reflection and the self-reflection was mentioned already also before and i think that really links also to the ethics and sustainability and the, the broader reflection on uh, on what yeah what you're doing as an engineer or a, a future engineer um and Graham also indicates eh, uh, the, the movement, eh, socially relevant, outward facing engineering curricula, where uh, student choice, multidisciplinary learning, societal impact, broad experience outside the classroom uh, and uh, across the world. And uh, the challenge still is to do that and eh, student centered learning to large uh, student cohorts. Um, so in small groups, that's already more often done. Uh, for bigger groups, that's still a big challenge. Um, yeah, we also feel that, although we already uh, have also some, uh, some uh, numbers I can show you later. Um, and uh, especially after Corona, it is on campus and online. It's really a combination. So online is nice, but this on campus hands-on experience, being together, that's also really key. Um, at TUA, at, uh, in, in Eindhoven, uh, we see that uh, engineers of the future need these uh, key 
uh, capability C, uh, T or pi shape profile. This means they still need some depth, at least one or two in-depth uh, uh, disciplines they know that also shows they understand that the deep engineering, at least in two aspects, shows that they are able to learn, they learn to learn, and the rest they will learn later uh, because the knowledge changes so quick. But they should be able, of course, to collaborate with many stakeholders, have an entrepreneurial mindset, so this action orientation, uh, and also be able to deal with uncertainty and systems level, which was also already mentioned before. And we really believe in systems thinking and really uh, uh, yeah, see working at, at systems level is, is really what uh, engineers need to do. And um, this is embedded in the vision of the university of the future, which I think is really an ambitious uh, uh, vision to educate engineers of the future. So we put their challenge-based learning central. I will explain uh, in, in the rest of the talk somewhat more. Um, uh, so putting really the big challenges and let students work on that uh, uh, central. And then uh, self-directed active learning. So really putting the student central and, and not the teaching and the courses, but the learning. Uh, focus on personal identity, on employability, uh, and uh, formal informal learning in context together with the ecosystem. So with all the different uh, uh, stakeholders involved, uh, and then offer students diverse and personal learning paths so that they really can follow uh, individually their path to develop themselves and find out uh, where they, yeah, where is their passion and uh, also improve themselves. Uh, so these are the, the main uh, ideas of the vision. Um, you see also a logo innovation space. So this is the um, education center, education innovation center or the learning hub uh, on campus where we develop this new type of teaching um, or learning um, for students. And um, we focus on linking education way more to outside world and, and yeah, the social economic impact. So it should not be economic only. Yeah. It's really linking to the outside world next to the link with research, which is strong in all uh, universities, I think, or in many, yeah, the link between education and research. We really put specific emphasis on uh, education and linking with the outside world. And this is what innovation space started with. Uh, on campus. Um, so we are front running then in implementing the concept of challenge based learning and we let students work on challenges and we do that in two different ways in courses and in extracurricular uh, student teams. And uh, just to give you some examples, we let students work on really open challenges. I, I, I really like that who defines the problems we let students define the problem. So the challenge is here, this is a collaboration with um, Netherlands Space Office. It's the Dutch uh, variant of the European Space Agency. So it's the local uh, uh, office. And they say to the students, develop something useful with satellite data. Right? So address a specific social or business problem with satellite data. So very general and from there, so it's a very broad uh, challenge and the students define themselves the problem. And uh, here there were two startups already. We do this since 2018, uh, this challenge. So uh, the team you see on the screen now is um, Space C and they developed uh, an app that 24 seven uh, monitors uh, seaweed farms on the North Sea. So, in the past, seaweed grows in North Sea farms and uh, people go there by boats and then they have to uh, see whether the, the seaweed there, what's the conditions and how is it growing. It costs a lot of money to go there with experts and divers and whatever. And they could do uh, uh, with the app solve this way easier, way cheaper. And their idea behind was is to really bring um, the uh, seaweed, it's another uh, better, more sustainable 
a way of using uh, or creating food for Earth. Eh? So that's a key. That was their drive, right? We want to do good for the Earth uh, and, and focus on other types of food. So seaweed, and then they developed the app. Um, so they determined these were a group of students they never met before. They started in my class on uh, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, got the challenge, and after five months, uh, they had the app developed and they also participate in entrepreneurship competition and ecocon. Uh, but um, this is how we do this. Let students define uh, the problems and tackle all the different issues and speak to all different stakeholders uh, involved with students from many different disciplines. It's completely interdisciplinary uh, student groups working in, in projects. Um, we do, so this was an entrepreneurship master course. Um, we also have the possibility for students, all students at the university can choose to do instead of having their bachelor end project. I think that's in all curricula uh, quite standard. Eh? At the end of your bachelor, you have a bachelor end project, a type of small research project. Here in Eindhoven, they can do that interdisciplinary. So with students, four or five students from the different departments on campus, from all different departments, and they can choose on a challenge that, that we offer a choice out of, uh, yeah, say, uh, what is it, 12 uh, challenges or something uh, per time, depending, uh, always more challenges than they are students, so there's really choice and they can go for their passion. And we can, uh, it's in the, in the healthcare, uh, in uh, renewable energy, in doing noise in cities, or a more practical uh, problems in, in cleaning uh, uh, the wheels. Um, so really, really broad variety, and based on their passion, they we form teams, and then they can work on solving uh, the problems. And it's also even with artists to really have people the other mindsets, different fields. Um, so this is challenge-based learning. I can talk way more. Uh, I have a definition for if you like to uh, to read it later. Um, what we do, and perhaps now is time. So I'm we are part of uh, yeah innovation space who, who set up uh, and who tries to implement this vision of the university, uh, the 2030 vision, educational vision. We take initiative to to bring uh, things to be. So I have a short movie to show somewhat uh, what we do. The Eindhoven University of Technology distinguishes itself worldwide when it comes to collaboration with innovative industries. In order to educate the engineers of the future, a learning hub has been added to the campus. TUE Innovation Space is the center of expertise for challenge-based learning and student entrepreneurship. A great source of inspiration is the success of the university's student teams, where students from different programs work together towards a common goal. In this way, they learn new skills, attitudes and knowledge, with great achievements. Innovation Space now offers the opportunity to engage in challenging projects within education. Students from all programs can participate in various courses and projects. They can choose a challenge they want to work on. Smart mobility, agri-food and tech, energy transition and many more topics. Real world, open-ended challenges are brought in by industry and society. This may also be a challenge from a designer or an artist. Or a challenge from one of the more than 30 student teams hosted in innovation space. The main goals are learning by doing and working in an interdisciplinary team with an entrepreneurial mindset. Lecturers, coaches and professionals from industry help to sharpen the students' entrepreneurial skills and keep an eye on both their personal and team development. For prototyping, students can use all available equipment and specialized staff is always around for explanation and assistance. There are various workshops in the building also the workshops of the Equipment and Prototype Center. They can provide technical research support for internal and external clients and are always open to advise and assist the innovation space students. To increase synergy and to create a broad community, many events are organized, such as presentations, workshops, 
speed dates, competitions and parties. TU Innovation Space, from dream to demo. Yes. So uh, this is we, how we started. We are now for four years, I think, doing uh, like this, setting up more courses. Um, and uh, yeah, first defining challenge-based learning. And you see now they are like 2,200 is written here. I think it's last year we had 2,800 students per year that can uh, go through these challenges, this type of challenge-based learning courses. We have now also 52 student teams that are under our umbrella, so they work um, next to the, the program, extracurricular, also on these big challenges. They are themselves completely in the lead because they define the challenge or they participate in a, in a broader competition. And these are also like 700 students uh, yearly uh, doing this. Um, and from uh, the original uh, um, founders of Innovation Space, it really scaled up to broader uh, the, in the different departments and the different programs, but we still are not yet there. So we have 13,500 students on campus and we have, say, 3,500 that uh, come in contact with uh, challenge-based learning. So still a long way to go if we want to upscale. Um, but we also collaborate outside the university already with um, uh, universities of applied science in our region. Uh, we will start professional education and, of course, many challenge zones in, in, in the region. Uh, we collaborate with other universities in the Netherlands and also European wise uh, in the Eurotech uh, universities. We have at this moment already uh, challenges together where there's really mixed students international uh, and where we exchange. Um, and looking ahead for me, uh, what I would love, this is what you recognized from the beginning, I would really love to have all the ecosystems around the university really linked that we can even often an, an even more uh, yeah, connected way of, of collaborating uh, with students and so having Ideally, the professionals together with the students learning also at different levels and collaborating not in just one challenge and another challenge and another challenge in the program, but we have learning lines that are thematic lines uh, that link students and they can even choose eh, in the individual parts from one to the other uh, or can continue in one thematic line they like on intelligent lighting or on uh, energy or on uh, health. Uh, and yeah, we really built this ecosystem such that uh, yeah, we create this really these engineers of the future um, that are also responsible uh, and uh, aware of what they're doing and starting from the drive and the needs they see uh, in society. I think this ends my talk. Thank you, Isabel, for presenting uh, the work you have been doing in transforming this space into an innovation uh, space. Um, I uh, want to give uh, the floor now to, to our members of the audience for any comments or questions. And um, in the meantime, there were some discussions about the parallels between digital and uh, sustainability immigrants. And you're mentioning that students are working on um, the SDG. Um, Gia, Gia, would you like to share uh, your comment with, uh, with a group? Uh, and, yeah, uh, so it ties. <laughs> Yeah, I, I worked in uh, um, uh, engineering schools as well, and I share your observations about how students are driving the movement. Uh, it's always start with student movement for sustainability and uh, ethics. And, yeah. uh, and so there are discourses about digital natives and, and um, from the student perspective, it seems to be um, um, uh, introducing more harms than, than positive effects. And I was just reflecting on uh, whether introducing uh, terms from the perspective of our like educator education researcher will 
um, create uh, more masses than than reducing <laughs> uh, the mass that already is. So yeah, I, I was just uh, um, putting a link there uh, as a critical re review on the digital native. Um, and uh, I agree that um, we, we could benefit for uh, with from from more student centered approach and build on more theoretical uh, work on students' perspectives and practices for SDGs. And thank you very much for for your presentation. It was really really inspiring. Um, yeah, you had a, a question that whether we did research on this. Uh, uh, it was a it was a comment on another comment. Ah, like that. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. because I missed all the the comments, so I'm now going through the chat. Yeah. Okay. And um, as um, as you are mentioning yes. the SDG and yes. also given Gia's comment, how do you feel that students um, um, react and engage with uh, challenges that have to do with the sustainable development goals? Yeah, they really. Uh, they want that you see that so much the drive um so uh, and it, yeah the sustainability the ethics all these topics also for them are key to be um to be discussed and even at the board they say we should not collaborate anymore with this type of companies or so they they bring in in the university i really think the the the, the type of critical thinking, it comes way more from the students than uh, from the staff. So, uh, but I don't know whether I answered the question. No. Anyone wants to pick up from uh, this comment or uh, have uh, a question for Isabel? Yeah, we should work on student perspectives, of course, but this is what we do. Eh? The student learning and student perspective is part of the research we do. So that's uh, also to understand how benefit learning works and what do the students learn and what do they bring in. So, of course, uh, yeah. And really, yeah, the sustainability is, uh, is a key topic uh, as well, uh, which we study. Corina, I see you have a question. Um, yes. Oh, no, no. <clears throat> yeah, but it's uh, basically just what I wrote. Um, hi, also from uh, DITU in uh, Copenhagen. Um, I wanted to, like, I, I think I, I got the message uh, quite clearly how it can help to foster um, an entrepreneurial mindset and independent learning and engagement with the SDGs. But um, do you have any specific practices to support the sense of, uh, to support an, yeah, responsibility among students? Is this through coaches or um, individual reflections or how do you, how do you foster that specific mindset? Yeah, so, but also the previous speaker, right, John Mitchell already said, um, and what we explicitly do is let students think, so they, have, and they are engineers, so they have to design. And uh, we ask them to look at uh, the, the feasibility, the desirability. And so these, all these different aspects and integrate them, balance them in the design. So I didn't, I thought when I heard that, I thought, oh, I should have put them that, that slide also in my presentation. But uh, so in the courses, we like we really ask the students to explicitly uh, think about these uh, different perspectives. So with the user, the feasibility, the technical side, the uh, also the environment, uh, also whether legal is it, uh, even that uh, perspective is taken into account. So these different perspectives are explicitly asked from students, and they have to reflect on that. So um, yeah. And so the coaches are key in this also, but it's also in the learning outcomes. Uh, we ask students to uh, reflect on it. Um, and yeah, so reflection is a, a key thing they do. So there's also a deliverable uh, reflection on the learning objectives, reflection on the teamwork and reflection on many different aspects. So um, 
yeah, and in the design itself, it's it's integrated because they have to look at the and they've ex made explicit how they value the different things and it's not just independent but also how they balance it because yeah, you know, it can be conflicting, eh? so more uh, technical, feasible, but then less uh, sustainable or whatever. So yeah, that's how we do. Okay, that's that's really great to hear because today I was just uh, in another course where like students were discussing about yeah was this meant to be for the environment or is it actually meant to be only a business case and then they kind of agreed that okay but it really has to be a business case because it has to be a like it um it's nice if we reduce food waste but i mean we do have to make money with it so they were kind of discussing about it and i was yeah actually i was wondering um if there is yeah well, how how you would go about that, but I think it's a it's a good point to to set the direction quite clear about um, having different parameters to evaluate the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and balance them, about... which is not easy, yeah. But it evokes a lot of discussion. You make it explicit, and I think that's that's the best we can do at this moment, and then make choices. But for sure, even in the entrepreneurship course, business is not the only aspect. Not at all. I really don't want that anymore. That's not the way to go. So. Uh, you can think of making things sustainable in the long run because everyone needs uh, money in some sense. But that's just one aspect and there are many uh, social uh, and, and many other uh, perspectives. So this is what should be put uh, together. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Corina. Uh, we have time for um, uh, one or two more questions for Isabel. And perhaps a question to you. Do you uh, see this also? And eh? this, I explained very briefly something on challenge based learning. Is this a way forward also for the, the, the integrated curriculum, uh, as the previous speaker said, or to give the. Um, do you really think we will develop responsible engineers when we, we expand this? Um, I think we have to. Um, I, um, I, yes, I, yes, I do. I think the uh, you know the challenge will always be there's always a proportion of the students that engage with this well and freely, and it comes quite naturally to them. There's there's a there's a group that are sort of non plus but you can encourage, and a group that struggle for well, more, more yeah. to get it. Uh, you know that that that. That that's natural, um, but I do think, you know, I I think one of the issues we face with some of these aspects is that we often we often get too stuck in our ways of trying to create experts in everything we think that our engineers should be experts in, yeah. rather than taking a view that the formation of a professional engineer is a long, drawn out process of which university education is only one small part. You know, and I, I, you know, I almost uh, there's been some writing about the view of this is it, it's almost like a driving license. It's not saying you are a, you know, you're you become a racing driver once you've passed your driving, but you are safe enough to go out in the world and to gain that sort of experience. And I actually think we perhaps need to think of our curriculum rather more in those terms that we are we are setting that those foundations that if we can leave students let students out into the world where this is within their framing of, of what it is to be an engineer and something, you know, that's why I talk about changing that culture. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think we will make them experts in sustainability or ethics or, you know, that that's beyond our, 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 our scope almost. Um, but, but so those seeds, you know, re, you know really rigidly that, that, that uh, th these things are important and that they must be, must be contemplated. Then I think, you know, we will have success yeah but it's now starting to make that explicit eh? to uh, to the the hardcore engineers in their own discipline that that's the biggest challenge now and if we can show that employers all also see it like this and eh? that they don't need engineers anymore with uh, all these uh, uh, like i really like your movie with all the books uh, on all these different topics that's indeed not uh, any more required, I guess. And if more people know this and understand, try to understand this, then we can move ahead. And 
Uh, but I mean, I think the other thing that, that, that plays to that is, and, and Donna mentioned it briefly as well, that, uh, you know, our, the engineers of the futures are not going to be the sole doers of things in the way that we have conceived engineers previously. You know, the, the, the you know, engineers are going to be mediators of technology in many sort of ways. They're going to be, inter you know, a, a, a central to interaction between AI and, and the physical and, 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 you know, and then there's a whole sort of different sort of roles that they're, they're going to play that are going to require many of these higher level skills, things that humans are, are innately, you know, have the potential to be very good at but machines find very difficult and that's where the roles are going to be and i you know i don't believe in this world where machines replace humans but the <laughs> but they are the roles will be different and the you know humans will be, be training machines will be mediating between machines and, and other aspects and that those sorts of roles that we've yet to yet to invent even if industry is not so cognizant of the requirements of that right now are, are going to be the jobs that our graduates are going to be doing And also picking up on uh, your comment about expertise and um, uh, what, um, how, how engineering education prepares students to think of themselves as potential experts or potentially doubting their expertise. I also want to engage with Donna, as you are also mentioning the question about epistemology and uh, uh, thinking also of the work that you have been doing with uh, Jana Lambrini do on the uh, Flint water crisis. How, um, how do you um, engage with students in challenging their assumptions about expertise and about uh, um, the objectivity, let's say, of uh, scientific truth vis-a-vis -vis the truth of um, and experiences of the communities they, uh, they will get to work with and for. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way for them to gain that experience is through community-based learning. That, that's really the best way to do that. Um, you know, when I was back at Smith, so this is 10, 10 years ago now, we partnered with a community organization that was seeking to close an aging nuclear power plant that was in our area that had been irresponsibly managed to the point where they had a cooling tower collapse based on not maintaining rotting wood and rusted bolts. I mean, it was, it was egregious. Um, and it was a Fukushima clone, which made it especially urgent after Fukushima happened. People were, um, you know, pretty, pretty uh, urgently seeking, um, including the state government of Vermont. So, so there was actually an alignment where they had, they had, they had made so many errors where the plant had to go offline that it angered all the other utilities in the region that had been relying on it as a you know source of reliable energy production when it couldn't even fulfill that promise it it really became a, a sort of a crisis but working with a community group that was concerned about leaks in particular right and really wanted to measure leaks and have and have ways to do that um and then working with uh this kind of the politics about this in the U.S. are hard to even articulate, but there's a whole bunch of engineers from the industry that have been completely sidelined. So anytime an engineer questions something about the nuclear industry, they get kicked out of the whole thing. So, so they were working both with some engineers that were formerly in the industry and the community group people. Um, and there was a variety of understandings of science, I'll put it that way, in the community group. And so the students had to navigate that and really think about, well, could we, and this is post Fukushima, there was a lot of citizen science going on where people in Japan were um, designing their own Geiger counters and getting out there and trying to get data because what they knew was that the radiation wasn't consistently distributed and couldn't be modeled well. You had to really ground truth that and see where, where stuff was field to field, right, in, in that area. And so we were learning from them and really looking at that kind of crowdsourced data. And there were lots of questions about the validity of, of doing that, right? Um, could you really trust a Jerry rig Geiger counter and what, so so we just dealt with all those issues um, in real time and talked about it and talked and uh, you listened to the community and you know the students definitely by then they were upper level undergrads so they definitely had this idea that they knew better and we just kept challenging it that you know what who knew what and and one of the things that was useful as almost a case study in this particular situation was that 
uh, about 10 years prior to that, when the, the plant had been owned by the state of Vermont, it had been a public utility and it was sold to a private corporation. And at that time, the private corporation was trying to squeeze dollars out of it. And so one of the things they proposed to do was a power uprate where it was gonna produce 20% more power than it was designed to do. And so there's an engineering ethics question in that, that when I'm an engineer and I design a plant and I tell you these are the tolerances, what is the trust that's implied there? <laughs> and what happens when after I'm dead, someone decides to push it beyond what it's designed for? Um, so, so there was that conversation and, and both the state engineer and the citizens group came down in the same position regarding opposing the uprate and telling the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that this was a bad idea scientifically because the uprate was going to cause uh, various components to vibrate in a way that they'd have to shut the plant down. And in fact, the citizens had been, and the state engineer had been correct. Um, and, and, and Energy Corporation, who had been the ones advocating for the uprate, um, ended up being wrong about that. And, and they had been sort of rubber stamped by the regulatory commission in the US to be able to do the uprate. So, so there was that kind of, um, kind of case study of, well, maybe, you know, who do you, who do you trust? It's, it, who knows what, how do you, how do you really test that knowledge? And they have to develop their own critical thinking skills. And, you know, with everything that's happened since 2012, that, that landscape has gotten much more thorny to navigate for people where um, the truth is hard to ferret out. So, <laughs> so they have to learn how to how to do that? How do you how do you understand what uh, what the truth is? Thank you, thank you for uh, such a detailed response. And I was not familiar with the example you gave, so very informative yeah. to Sorry, think that about was a long, it. Long story, no, but... <laughs> it was uh, very, as I said, very useful yeah. in its details. That is what community based learning does. It allows you to get that kind of depth. Um, I know I have um, a debt to Emanuela Tilly to bring uh, up the question of uh, assessment. Uh, Emanuela, uh, would you like to, um, uh, to address your question to our free speakers? So your uh, comment uh, was... Um, about the assessment of ethics and whether the panelist can mention how ethics is assessed in their programs or schools and any references to leading literature in this area would be welcomed, um, says Emanuela. I, I, I would say it depends on what you're trying to assess. So you, you, I think there's a variety of outcomes that you might be after. So. Um, so there are, there are a variety of measures you could use. I know here at Purdue, uh, Justin Hess teaches our multidisciplinary ethics class, and he's very interested in perspective taking, development of empathy, and those kinds of things. And so, so he's apt to use those kinds of tools to see where students are, to really, um, you know, review the quality of reflection, the, the ability to, to take different perspectives and to understand different points of view. I think that's a key one for for ethics, but there's lots of different different ways people go about it. Other experiences at um, uh, UCL or TUE, and uh, Joanna, I see you are here um, uh, present, and I know you have been working on empathy. I think you have also collaborated with uh, Justin Hess. So, if you want to point to some um, uh, some work on this area, uh, please feel welcome to drop uh, on chat uh, some of the articles. Yeah, regarding assessment, we are there is still a long way to go. I think this is still in a very traditional, I feel. And yeah, we are starting our project to go to competence based learning uh, and also not assess on uh, in courses, but on program level. But yeah, that's uh, still a long way. And I think in the end, that's necessary 
And then you can also, so it's not just in one project, but you want really students to have this critical thinking and develop that over different projects. And uh, should not be just as, as previous speaker said, that it should not be just a module or something separate. It should be, and how to assess this? Yeah, I don't know yet, but uh, this is really something we have to work on. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think it is a very interesting issue. I mean, I know from personal experience, you know, Mark, the reflections of students are always incredibly interesting, but as they are challenging to Mark. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and it, it, it is always hard necessarily not to bring your own, your own perspective to it. I mean, normally you are marking as an expert who, you know, will we'll assess, a, will critique a, an argument in, in, in some form that you, you have a view of what is right or wrong about that, that argument, whereas often in these cases you are, you know, you want it to be a situation where you could actually fundamentally disagree with what the student is saying, but still value it and give, give good marks for it. And that, that's a very difficult and unusual position for, for, for many staff to be in. And it's, it's quite a, quite a contested space. So I think there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be, to be thought about in, in, in how we, you know, I, you know obviously, uh, we are in this right assessments arms race where if marks are not attributed to it, it, it they're not valued in quite the same way if we could get out of that then doing things like this would be so much easier but certainly my institution is a feels a long way away from being out of that arms race but uh, maybe that's where we need to be Thank you. And uh, we have time for uh, one final comment. And uh, I see uh, via chat, um, uh, Jason, I give uh, the floor uh, to you. Well, thank you. I just thought it was quite interesting when Donna brought up the assessment of the truth in information or data. And I, I think a lot of students, rightly so, and that's the, the beauty of being educated today is when you're sitting in a lecture and you're not quite grasping what you're being told, you might seek alternative sources of information. And that's great that students have that kind of access now, but assessing whether that information is accurate or correct is, is quite important. And I don't know that we put a lot of emphasis on assessing the quality of information in our education at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you for this point. So the, in a way, a question could be, uh, is there room for uh, teaching students about mm -hmm. how to deal with misinformation and how to choose uh, relevant information mm -hmm. sources? I often wonder whether we shouldn't be giving case mm -hmm. studies and getting the students to actually look at a case study of of an engineering project and then analyze the ethics that are associated with that and then feed that back to the class. Um, that's one way we can actually um, bring about some, some understanding of the importance, for instance, in terms of, of, of civil engineering and the work that you're doing in an indigenous space and analyze how you are affecting that indigenous space. And so the case study then could present what the story was all about. Like here in Australia, we've had some situations where mining has taken place in indigenous spaces and has dramatically affected the history of that particular space. So giving that to students to analyze, they can then be thinking about how engineering can actually affect a, an indigenous space, but not only in terms of that, but when it actually comes to the sustainability of a river, the sustainability of a space in which uh, a project is taking place. So uh, case studies, I think, can work very well uh, and pre when presented to the students themselves. But then the students also in terms of the work that they actually do outside of the classroom in terms of the real life experiences 
uh, of, an, of an engineering project that too uh, has its benefits. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, final example. Do we have time for a very quick response uh, to this challenge? I completely agree with Tony. I mean, that there's a great case study uh, about cleanup here in the US where a uh, native group did not uh, have a, a conceptualization of background levels. And so the notion that they were going to clean the site to background levels was not acceptable. It, it needed to be cleaned up, period. And that was a very interesting, right? And a, a great place to talk about all of those things where epistemology comes in. Thank you. It's uh, unfortunately we had uh, our time today cut short and um, uh, I would have uh, continued this conversation for longer. I had a great time listening to all the presentation and all the comments and discussions uh, that uh, were linked to with, uh, um, with the insights brought by the speakers. I wish you a beautiful summer and uh, we shall meet uh, beginning with September for our um, uh, upcoming uh, seminar series. And this is also an open invitation to you. Cefi Ethics Group is an open group and we want to bring topics that are of relevance to you to bring speakers that you want to have present. So please uh, write, uh, write to me. I will put the address if you have suggestions for topics for speakers and self-nominate yourself. My, my best uh, wishes to you all until the uh, autumn. Thanks, Diana, for also for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. You have now my email address. <laughs> Bye.